So I'm really pleased to say that joining us now around the table is David Hunt, the CEO of PGM. David, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. It's nice to be with you. Thank you very much for being with us. I want to pick up on Shanali's comments yes. at the end there. The prospect of money coming out of money market funds and migrating elsewhere. Are you beginning to see that trend develop? You know, Jonathan, we, we are seeing that. Um, we've seen that really for the last six months, but it's been small, uh, small pieces. But I do think it's beginning to pick up, uh, pick up steam. And some of the reasons are obvious. Um, you know, certainly I've, at, at a higher level, level of, uh, of interest rates relative to money market funds. And as we begin to see rates peak and then decline, duration begins to look a little bit more, more attractive. But there are two other things that are going on which are as, at least as important. One is that the big pension funds with higher rates are actually better funded. And so they actually are using this as a chance to de-risk. And that means for them, they are moving money into fixed income. And the second is that uh, you know we have the continued demographic trends going going on, not just in this country, but around the world. And retirees need income. So we are in the process now of this huge shift from accumulation products to decumulation and income products. And those need fixed income. So if you take the kind of short-term shift, you add to them two structural shifts, we think over the next three years, we really are seeing to see bonds are back. This sounds like a new regime. And I'm going to give your team a bit of a shout out because well, you're a you. modest man. Mike Collins, Greg Peters, Robert Tip, just absolutely phenomenal phenomenal, pre-pandemic, really defining that bond market regime of yesteryear. Can you talk to me about how different this regime is going to be compared to that we, one? We think it will be different. And uh, you're right. They were, they were right on the lower for longer for quite a long time in that. And then more recently, um, our call has actually been that we're going to be higher. So if you go back six months, we were very early to the, hey, we're looking at kind of two cuts uh, for, uh, for 24 when the market was pricing in seven. And uh, we held with that view, and the market's kind of come back to us at this point. So we pride ourselves on taking, I think, considered uh, non-consensus views that are long-term in nature rather than simply trading views. And I think that we've made a very good job on those. Um, and I will say that in order to do that, you need a culture that supports people uh, to take those non-consensus views, um, even during times when they don't look so right. And many organizations have a hard time doing that. And we're, we're proud of our culture to do it. To rip up the script just quickly, because I've, I've got Tom Keen's shadow over me and all of these banking <laughs> earnings have come yes. out with compensation <laughs> expenses coming up. Is it getting harder to recruit and keep that kind of talent? It, it, no question it is. I mean, uh, if, you, if you look just over the last 20 years, you would say that many of the functions and things that used to be done in the investment banks are now being done on the buy side. I mean, I have more than 130 credit analysts. You would never have seen that um, you know, before. All of that would have been done uh, you know, by Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, and we would have bought research from, from, from them. So the actual value chain continues to move from the sell side to the buy side. And that's a trend that I don't think uh, is, is going to change. And that, of course, puts a lot of pressure on uh, those of us on the buy side because we do need uh, to move our compensation uh, levels up uh, in, in, in step with that. So the war for talent is very real and very practical for us day to day. So artificial intelligence, how do you use that? And I'm really I'm diverging here. I was going to talk about <laughs> bonds being back. But this is fascinating to me. I wanted to, to talk about Greg Peters' bonus. Okay, but, well, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can go there next to talk about the wine bar. But I am curious about, you know, this idea of how you make things more efficient to reduce costs while continuing to prioritize this talent. I mean, how, how do you see that playing out? Or do you think that some of the gains of productivity are overstated and that it really just comes down to talent and people who can do the job best? So I think that we are in the midst of a game changer on technology. In, in asset management over the last decade, um, technology's mostly been about can we automate things, can we get more efficient at things, and so it has been a bit of a cost play. Um, that's not where the game is today. Uh, technology now is allowing us to move data to the cloud and then to do things with artificial intelligence that we never could do before. And so it now is actually being used by our investors. 
it's actually being used by the front line to make decisions. That's a very different use of technology than it was before. I think that's very exciting. But it means that we are needing to significantly up our game on the use of technology and making sure that we're employing some of these latest uh, uses of it um, in our actual investment process as well as trying to get more efficient in, in, in some of the back office functions. But that's different for the industry. So you're saying it's making you more efficient, but not that it means you need a leaner team. It means that the quality of jobs that we have will actually be better because we will take a bunch of things that are kind of fairly rote and we'll be able to do that uh, much more efficiently with technology. And then we will be able to augment our portfolio managers with technology so that they're actually making better investment decisions. And that's what they want to focus on anyway. So the more I can focus them on the higher value topics, uh, the better and happier they, they, they are through the use of technology. When you look at AI and inflation, well, let's come back to the U.S. economy. <laughs> We're going to come back to inflation. Um, Sorry, you, that's my fault. You say there's an, an outlook for the, the economy as weak inflation. But is that the rest of the economy or also as well in the United States where we see continuously hot data? Yeah, so so the, the, the big story that I think doesn't really get reported enough is that the world has never been, uh, at least in, in the last couple of years, more divergent in their views of growth. So spending time uh, in Europe, I would say actually the UK is in a technical recession right now. You spend time in Germany, boy, growth is really hard to come by and it's not looking so, so terrific. And inflation continues to be a worry, but it's coming down a lot and is related to mostly to energy prices. You move to the US and actually growth is higher than most people thought. The, the labor market is in excellent uh, shape and growth uh, appears and productivity appears to be, uh, to be better. Inflation is higher and rates are higher. Um, I just spent last week uh, in Japan and uh, you know it's fascinating. Uh, after literally 30 years of trying to get inflation to go again, the, it's a beautiful spring week. Uh, the cherry blossoms were out, and there is a spring in the Japanese step. Uh, they finally have inflation coming back. They have productivity in numbers that look better. They have some growth. And so the stock market is at an all-time high, and you feel an optimism in Japan. We saw the numbers come out of China. So China continues uh, to push on manufacturing in order to get their economy going. I think all of us wish that they had the tools to get domestic personal consumption going because that's really the rebalancing that they need in their economy. The way they're going right now is just going to flood the world with cheaper uh, manufacturing goods, which is you know, maybe going to export deflation uh, back to kind of five years ago. But it's not the balancing that we, that we would hope. And I think that if they could get their domestic consumption going, it would be good for the Chinese people, good for the Chinese economy, and better for the world economy. So the reason we come to weakflation, to come to your question, <laughs> is that the world is very different. But when you put all of that together, growth is going to slow from, from what it has been. Um, and we are going to have higher inflation, we believe, for longer, and higher rates. And that's where you get the weakflation piece of it. And it's very different from stagflation, where the, obviously the labor market is in bad shape. We think the labor market is pretty strong. There's a ton to unpack there. <laughs> I want to unpack the China piece of it just a little bit mm. and focus on that. That growth model at the moment is controversial. It's getting all of the wrong kind of attention from policymakers worldwide, particularly here in the United States. And there is talk of maybe even more policies going against China from the United States. Secretary Yellen's been talking about that over the last week. Does that make it harder for you to run a global business? Is it more difficult now than it used to be? Yes, it, it, it certainly is. And I think uh, m many of us are headed down to the IMF meetings this week. And I think that one of the big topics is going to be what are the impacts uh, of the new Chinese economy and what will the US administration do uh, in, in response to that. I will say, having spent a week in Japan, that the country that is the number one beneficiary of the, the tension between the U.S. And, and China is Japan. When I was there, there were three companies launching new chip manufacturing centers there. There was companies that wanted to invest more in Japan. And so Japan has actually taken on a role in Europe, in, in Asia, and in a pan-Asia trade war that they didn't have before. 
And the other thing that's happened is that the security alliances have come together, I think, faster than any of us would have thought. When, when I spend time with folks in the, both the diplomatic and security world there, the coming together of, of Japan, of South Korea, now of the Philippines and Australia, is creating a stronger alliance than we had before. And so, you know, these kinds of reverse powerful impacts that we have are hard to predict, but they do change those supply chains quite a lot. You've mentioned Japan a few times. Mm. You visited there. Are you building out the business there? What are you up to in Japan? So we are one of the largest foreign asset managers in, in, in Japan. Um, we uh, absolutely believe that it's a critical uh, country. Uh, obviously, if you just look at where is the money around the world, Japan remains one of the wealthiest and highest savings places. So there's a lot of money to manage. Is that money coming home? So the, the money is, is coming home to some extent, but also foreign money, as I mentioned, is going in, both portfolio flows and FDI, which, again, is a fairly new story, Jonathan. It's a massive change. <laughs> David, I'm pleased to say you're going to stick with us. Got a lot to talk about. David Hunt there of PGM. David Hunt of PGM saying this. Bonds are back. We anticipate investors will move a chunk of the enormous pile of funds now sitting in money markets back into high-quality strategies that have some duration as they see rates begin to reduce. David, I'm pleased to say, is still with us around a table for some final thoughts. So let's talk about where the money is set to go. Mm -hmm. We've heard a million times the phrase survive until 2025. <laughs> Can you talk to us about the pockets of fixed income that you're not constructive about, that you are perhaps even concerned about? Well, I think that um, you know we certainly have seen while yields are high, spreads are compressed. And so uh, there are parts of the market right now where you aren't getting paid uh, for the risk. And we would say some of the lower quality uh, areas of high yield and others would fit that bill uh, at, at the moment. Um, but broad Broadly, I think that there's probably way too much uh, attention paid to exactly when the Fed begins to move, and not enough to the most important question, which is the fact that we're going to have higher rates for longer. So even when they do begin to come down, they're not going to come down that much. And that's going to mean that you're going to have higher yields for the next several years. So as a, as a long-term investor, as the fourth largest bond manager in the world, that's our focus. And we believe that bonds will be uh, a very important part of a portfolio going forward, as will credit more broadly. And we've talked a lot about the public markets, but we're one of the largest private credit managers in, in, in the world. And we continue to believe uh, that that will be uh, a really good growth uh, engine, both for institutional investors, increasingly retail and high net worth, and for the, the money management business. Um, because banks, despite all of the earnings that you all have covered today, continue to pull back from their core lending functions because of capital constraints. So when you talk about private credit, a lot of people have been going into this field. It is the idea here that there are companies that are becoming unbanked, that don't have 800 FICO scores, they're the equivalent of that <laughs> in corporate speak, um, that are becoming unbanked in public markets by, frankly, just the banks, that you're selling or that you're buying their bonds, you're holding them for the long term and hoping to clip a coupon of, say, 7-8%. So it's a, it's a combination uh, of, of all of the things that you said. First of all, there are many middle market companies, uh, which are very good credits, but for whom the banks really can't lend to in the way they did because of the new kind of capital regime that came on after the GFC. And if we get another round of increased capital uh, constraints on the banks, that's going to become even harder for them. So this growth you've seen in direct lending, which is lending uh, really into those smaller companies, has been quite quite significant, and we think that that will continue to, to grow. But the other area in this has been asset-based finance. So for many, many years, most of this was funded, again, by banks and also by the commercial finance companies, um, whether or not that was aircraft leases or rail cars or solar panels. And that kind of asset-based finance now is coming more and more into uh, core institutional asset manager portfolios. We've been a fairly large player uh, in that, and we would say as we look forward, uh, we think that asset back will be one of the larger areas uh, that fixed income will continue to grow. So you've got you know, public markets where we see attractive credit, we've got direct lending and some of the higher quality uh, private markets, and you now have an ABF market uh, that is growing. So we remain very constructive on credit, public and private, looking forward over the next several years. Let's just sit on private and mm -hmm. wrap it up there as well. So we caught up with Mark Rowan over at Apollo, who I'm yep. sure you know well. Yep. And we said to Mark, can you define the private market opportunity? 
opportunity and Mark said basically everything on a bank balance sheet. Do you think there's enough space for everybody? How big is this opportunity? Because we hear every single asset manager talk about the same thing. So I think that the good news is that actually private credit, particularly direct lending, is actually maturing. And institutional investors who for a number of years, all kinds of people got into this business and set themselves up and immediately kind of were able to raise money. I think that that period is now over. Institutional investors are much pickier about the managers that they're using to do uh, really private credit. And so we're seeing a fewer managers raise more money in that space, and I think that will continue. Because in investors want to see that you have you know, multiple track records, that you've done this over a period of cycles, and that you have the credit skills to do it. Your, your ability to just set up a new shop and raise money, I think, is a lot less now than it was three years ago. There'll be a bit of a shakeout in, in that, and that's no bad thing. David, I've loved this. We've got to do it again soon. Thanks Thank for you for having me. Thank you so much. David Hunt there, the CEO of PG.